guys, it's Kat from the Motor Home Travel website, Wandering Bird, where we share tips and tricks for touring the UK and Europe by motorhome or camper. Today I'm quite excited because we're talking about something that we've not done before, and that is taking your motorhome to the mountains during winter. We've been in the mountains during March, and we've been as late as sort of November, December time, but we haven't been right in the thick of winter and stayed for an extended period of time. So what we thought we would do is talk to somebody who has done that. They took their motorhome skiing for an entire season. And we wanted to talk to them about how they find places, how they manage things like water and gas, and basically what life's like living in a motorhome in the middle of a lot of snow. So we hope that you find this useful. I will say as a caveat that I'm filming this in November 2020. The UK, or sorry, England, is currently in lockdown. France is in lockdown. I have no clue if we're going to actually get to use any of these tips during this winter. I really hope that we will, but that remains to be seen. But I hope that whenever you're watching this, these tips are fairly universal. So whether it's this winter or next winter or sometime a couple of years in the future, you find these useful and it will give you somewhere to start prepping your van and knowing what to sort out when you want to take it away during the winter months if there's a lot of snow. If you're new to the channel, hi, welcome. If you want to find out more motorhome tips, then by all means, head to our website, wandering-bird.com. And don't forget as well to click the subscribe button and the little bell, and you'll be notified when a new video from us comes out. Also, if you're looking for gifts for Christmas or want something for the new season to welcome in 2021 with a bang, our road trip logbooks and journals are now available to purchase. There's a link for that in the show notes if you want to find out more. I think that's everything from me. So let's dive on in and find out how we can take our motorhome to the mountains in winter. much about skiing in a motorhome although that sounds weird you're not actually skiing in a motorhome but taking your motorhome to the snow so um my partner and i james we went on an epic grown-up gap year um a few years ago very soon after we've met actually um test of a new relationship and um yeah we jumped in a motorhome and spent the season in the alps and along the way we decided we'd blog it for our friends and family and James wanted to try his hand at blogging which he got into and we I would say probably had 40 years experience compacted into one season because it was a really unusual season horrendous weather we had a very temperamental motorhome and a lot of other things were happening um, around the world there was a really bad flu pretty similar but on a very small scale to what we're experiencing now that was affecting a lot of Europe so everything in a nutshell we managed to squish into five and a half six months brilliant and where did you go Uh, everywhere um the whole point of it for us was we wanted to not be restricted to a place where the snow was perhaps a bit rubbish and that we could choose where we went and when we went. So, for example, we focused on higher altitude places at the back end of the season when the snow tends to get a bit rubbish lower down. Um, we could, you know, hop from mountain to mountain, really, making sure that we got the best conditions that for what we were looking for and some respite because there were times when we came out of the mountains to recuperate. We spent a little bit of time in Italy in Lake Maggiore and just to avoid that was to avoid the beast from the east part two we spent Christmas in Evian we went uh, to Fontainebleau to go climbing when the weather had really started to we had a couple of weeks that were really rubbish so yeah so it was you know much the same as any motor so it was all out space or did you do Pyrenees as well no we that time we didn't go to the Pyrenees we have been to the Pyrenees we we got as far out as the Dolomites so um, a bit of a variation um, across sort of the, the alpine regions of sort of the mid uh, European 
mountains. Okay. We want to take our motor home to the mountains in the middle of winter. We've, we've taken it into the mountains. We know that the brakes and stuff, it's all good. But what do we need to think about with our off-the-shelf, bog-standard, swift motorhome before we take it into the middle of winter up a mountain? Well, <clears throat> as you know, you, you let me know what make and model you've got. Yeah so that I could have a good look around and I watched your video on your tour so I had the layout sass oh, you've prepared I'm impressed it's important because <laughs> everybody's motor homes really are different and um some very small things seemingly to most people who are three season tourers might be quite significant in terms of um capabilities in winter um, you have the very fortunate position that you have uh, an internal freshwater tank. Yes, we do. That is probably one of the biggest issues that anybody has when they first take their motorhome skiing is probably, if they haven't considered it before that hand, they will very quickly find out that not having water is a huge problem. And, and then also... Way is there a way to fix it if someone has bought a motorhome that has an external water tank? I'm guessing that's an underslung tank. Yeah, that's what you'd call an underslung tank. Um, honest answer is you can bodge it, you can make it better, and you can choose better places to stay mm -hmm. and different times of the season to go that will reduce the likelihood of you having any challenges. And you can also stay on a campsite and drain your tanks so that you don't need those um, services and that they don't compromise your system. Because it's not only about not having water, it's about the fact that when it goes wrong and it freezes, it doesn't just freeze your tanks, it freezes your pipes, it freezes all sorts of U-bends, your toilet can get frozen. It, there's a lot of things that are a real pain in the side if you, um, if you get it wrong. And it's sort of out of your control because you know in the winter you can have really warm days where um the sun comes down and actually really warms up your motorhome to the point where you would never consider that you would have any problems and within the blink of an eye you can be at minus 20. so is, there's only so much you can do to prepare for that and you know avoidance is sometimes the best policy if you've got an underslung tank however we had an underslung tank um and can speak probably to every modification that you can possibly make because we started off with what most people do, which is uh, bubble wrapping it. That wasn't our choice. That was what the winterized pack came from the manufacturer. Which van did you have? We had an, um, an Eldis. Um, we were supplied it as part of a blogging program from um, Eldis and we were, our objective was to test the viability of a British van in these conditions in insulation so the water tank so if we go back to the water tank, yeah, yeah. Um, that, that's great for you um what we would also say is always you leave your gray waste tank open when you're on site and you use a receptacle underneath to collect it whether that's a bucket don't use one of these roller things that the caravanners use yeah. um you know with the small thing because there's no difference with that once that's filled up with water and frozen it's pretty difficult to manoeuvre and, and manage in the same way that anything that's closed would be. Um, so that's what you, you always do. Get on site, stick a bucket under it. We actually cut up um, an old oil container drum um, to make it easier so it had a handle and then you can just shove it um, down the waste disposal units at the air or campsite where you are. Um, Secondly, pipes, pipe work. You, the way you consider this is the whole thing's an ecosystem. And if one bit goes wrong, it's going to have an impact on another bit, whether that's your pump, which is obviously you need to protect these systems because they're very expensive when they go wrong. And uh, yeah, with your, with your pipe work, if you get a small frozen bit in your pipe work, it can very quickly expand up the pipes in both directions. It can go into your pump area. And so it, it sort of suddenly has an impact on everything. And that's even little things like getting like a nice block in your, in your plug. And we discovered that a lot of our pipe work, and that's not just the hot and cold feed, but it's the waste has U-bends in it, you know, that you don't um, anticipate. But for example, at the bottom end of our shower, the pipe comes down out of our shower and goes back up before it goes out 
So you've got a clunker of water there. In the waste tank. So you've got, once that's solid, there's nothing going to shift it. So how do you combat that then? Uh, hair dryer. <laughs> hair dryer. Okay. Um, you don't. Um, there are, there's two types of things. You do everything you can to prepare in advance and then you take some backup measures and a backup measure will always be a hair dryer. Um, what you will do with pipes is insulate them. And in many cases, you'll find your pipes run along the body of the inside of your van. Yeah. And some people have a double floor. And in that double floor, there will be blown air. And some systems actually accommodate for that. So they're heating that double floor area and creating a pocket. That's where all of those services are contained. Mm -hmm. That is your ultimate situation. If you're looking to buy a motorhome with the intention of going to the mountains, then a double floor is a really good idea. Mostly you're only going to find that in European specification. Yeah. Um, vehicles, German, Slovenian. Um, I'm tell my husband this because he's going to try and find a way of installing that in our van, and yeah, well, no, we, we won't go down that route. The other thing is you've got to be really careful of this. If you have a good van and it's still under warranty, anything you do to it, yeah, um, you know, pulls it out of warranty, and um, that can cause some issues. But what we did, um, the first things we did were to insulate the pipes and it's not sufficient to do it with the grey standard foam insulation that you will find here in the UK. Um, what you need is something called Armaflex um, and Armaflex is like a really dense black foam. Mm -hmm. um, you can get that in any bricolage and you can get that by the sheet actually with sticky back on it oh. so you can actually use it to insulate things like your wheel arches we kind of made it up as we went along because we were already on the road and already in a real pickle. Um, so we went to a bricolage and we bought as much of that. We actually had some uh, silver foil, you know, the bubble foil. And we did all of our wheel arches. You would be surprised where why he did is. Why did you make your wheel arches? Why did we? Why, why, why is that a thing? Um, because anywhere in your van where heat can escape, it can, cold can also get in. And because all the pipe work ran, ran alongside um, th what is essentially a plastic and metal body, mm. composite bodies, um, you'll find that even where it's a composite, a plastic composite, it sits in metal runners. And all it takes is for a pipe to touch anything like that and it will instantly cause a problem um so you get some of that armor flex and you literally go around every single pipe individually yeah. don't ever um cover your pipes together because they run side by side okay. and uh, with little cable ties and you make sure every joint particularly over the joints that's really important is covered and if you live with a plumber it will be really really tidy and look really nice and if you don't it doesn't matter it just needs to get the job done and it's safe to drive, like, from the UK to the Alps with that already on? Yeah, I mean, you do, it's safe to drive like that all the time. It stops heat getting out and it stops cold getting in and it stops heat getting in. There's no, there's no reason why you wouldn't do that in the first place. And obviously, manufacturers are meeting price points. Mm. And it's fiddly, it's laborious, and there's an expense to it that, you know, that they choose not to um, undertake. Um, so pipe work brilliant idea covering everything else under your um storage spaces and things like that with a layer of um insulation of some sort um is a great idea if you're just going for a week or two it's it's just not worth your while to do that so extensively but when you're on the road for six months you want to really have a really good experience and you haven't got time for all of this um, messing about on a day-to-day -day basis which you know it will take a good hour can take two hours to defrost pipes that have frozen overnight you don't want any of that so it's best to do it beforehand it'll take a weekend to do the whole job um, so from your perspective that's the first thing I would do cool. um, we did have some discussions about other things that you would specifically need to do for your motorhome and there aren't that many um, we would probably rec it's probably recommending a few bits of gear that will really go on then with my light list what what should we have on board before we head off 
I'm going to say it, winter tyres. Yeah. You have to have winter tyres. There's loads of reasons for it. Um, you can actually link to uh, the very comprehensive, detailed uh, blog we did with the former head of Continental Tyres, mm-hmm. who spoke specifically about this. Uh, that's your biggest expense. Secondly, thermal screen. I don't know if you have one, an yeah, external. We just got one, funnily enough, and I'm going to do a review on it because we did get it for uh, as part of a deal. Uh, but yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, they're brilliant. And um, if you're going to go for any length of time or if you're planning on going in January, yeah. uh, we would recommend having uh, the full bonnet skirt. Okay. So a, yeah, so you have a screen that hooks over your doors. Um, in our case, we've got um, a pull down so that you can pull the, the windscreen down during the day so you don't have to take it off if you want the light in. Um, and then a, a full bonnet skirt which goes around the bonnet because you would be probably surprised to know how much uh, ventilation gets from your um, engine bay in through to the body of your vehicle. Um, it's not so much of an issue with people who've got van conversions where they've kept a bulkhead in. Yeah. But um, if you don't have a bulkhead, even just having, yeah, I mean, you're probably in the same situation as us, you've got a screen that you can pull across the yeah. cab, that makes a difference. And if you consider how much of a difference that makes, then if you simply cover your bonnet, you don't need don't, In fact, we haven't even got that. We've, we've got on the front windscreen, we've got the screen, yeah. but the, the actual cab seats are part yeah. of the living room because they turn around. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, yeah so so that's definitely worth thinking about you know what you can do it with a tarp if you're only going for a month they are expensive if you are a winter traveler they're worth the investment but if you're only going a couple of times a tarp from your local diy store will just do the job a few because they've got the eyelets in yeah. just strap it on does the same job We've talked about this before, um, it, which is a Karcher window vac. Oh, I love my Karcher. <laughs> Best motorhomes in the world still um, combat the people factor and the cooking factor and the shower factor, and you can't beat physics. Um, so most people, particularly in the winter, with the fluctuating temperatures um, inside and outside, will suffer from condensation. Yeah. Um, if anyone who's not seen a Karcher, it's basically a vac for the inside of your windows and you just vac the water. It's magic. It yeah. takes 10 seconds. We used to fight over who did it in the morning because it's that much fun. <laughs> so much fun. <laughs> and um, the good news is that I think we charged it once in six months. Yeah, they're, that, they're just amazing. Yeah. So yeah, so those are the three big things. Um, but I think another thing that was really important to talk about, which James sort of said to me, that if you're going to talk to Kat, the most important thing to talk about is power, because you don't really have the same experience. Particularly, you've got solar, haven't you? Yeah. Um, there's a huge argument about whether you'd have solar on a on a winter van and how useful it is. Um, if you only go in winter, which we know we're in the minority of two people. <laughs> um because we're not massive fans of traveling in the summer in a van (laughs) but if you're only traveling in winter we would never bother we just wouldn't invest in solar um in the mountains a lot of the places you're going to park are in valleys or they're shadowed by these enormous mountain peaks even when you're right you know right at the top um for a good proportion of the day the sun is really low in the sky if you notice outside at the moment you know how little light you would get compared with in the summer um so your van's almost parked in shade you know for a vast proportion of the day it's just not worth it and it's also not something worth being dependent on Mm -hmm. because what we found is people who had solar panels parked in the most extraordinary places just to get light and we didn't want to be sort of controlled by that kind of thing so having you know you get really resource conscious which is great and I think that's one of the beauties of most homing you know knowing you've got 100 litres of water until you can get you know supplies up and knowing you've only got this much space and this much fuel so gas gas is a big issue um you've got LPG tank haven't you yeah we do so when you fill up LPG in, uh, particularly in France and well, in all mountainous areas in the winter, um, it's a different uh, mix. It's got uh, high levels of propane in it, 
less proportion of butane um because butane freezes well no <laughs> that's not true butane doesn't vaporize <laughs> it's sort of one of those gas things so it doesn't convert from a, a liquid to a gas quickly so it's not usable um so they switch over the mix at the fuel stations um in the proximity yeah so you won't get that issue can all the can all the systems just handle both mixes yeah 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 Yes. Yeah. It is a big challenge for people to bend their heads around, especially if you're used to touring in the UK where you pick up a Cala bottle and you can change it in any campsite and you've got all your adapter things and you know you've gone through this a lot before. Um I just circle back to power. So if you're not gonna use solar, if you're right under there. <laughs> if you're not gonna use solar yeah. and you're not in a campsite, which we're gonna talk about shortly is, is campsites and electric power and stuff. What did you use if you were wild camping or off-grid parking or whatever you call it? Um, the first thing we used was not having any power. <laughs> Fair enough. Did you put in like a second battery or anything or did you not bother? Uh, actually, uh, that's, a, that's a weird story, but we, we did request a second leisure battery uh -huh. um, and we didn't install it for a number of reasons, primarily legal actually, because if you don't have a, a, a space for a second contained battery, uh -huh. you shouldn't have one. Oh, that's true, yeah, and a lot of. In fact, I don't think ours has got space for a second one. No. Um, also, they're only they're only as good as how much power you can fill in them. Yeah. So it's great if you've got loads of solar and you're travelling in the summer and you've got two leisure batteries and you can pump them full until you know you can use as much power as you want. Yeah. Especially if you've got an inverter, you don't need to worry about any of those things. But there's no point in having loads of solar and loads of mechanisms for creating power, but no method of storing it. Yeah. we had a generator and do a lot of people use those yes um there's a bone of contention about them some some of the reasons that people don't choose to stay on winter airs actually is because they don't like the sound of generators some people use them very respectfully i mean there's a very different culture on airs in the in the winter to what there is in our experience in the spring which is as far as we've managed to risk um and it is a you know you you wouldn't hear people typically putting a generator on at eight o'clock at night what happens is people come back in from skiing they whack the generator on they top up their battery they do everything power hungry they want to and then they turn it back on again in the morning if they need to but with if you're conscious about the amount of resource you're using then it's fine you know you can ju you just adapt so, so you need to be really really careful about your power especially you know cooking on gas trying to avoid we have for some reason in our motorhome we didn't have led lights if you don't have led lights in your vehicle that is the first thing you need to change it's madness yeah. really it's it's for something when you've got such a finite resource to put in, and they're hot as well you yeah. know yeah, so, so power from that perspective is really important. So having a generator is a, a real lifesaver. It also stops you having to worry about everything yeah. all the time. And, and, you know, the things like hookup isn't always available. So, for example, one of the most popular places is Les Des Alpes. And they, you know, if you look at any of the books that say they've got 44 spaces or something like that in summer, when you get there, there are only 12. And wow. Why, well, so, in the winter. why so many much fewer i can't speak made that into english they say it is because the rest of the car park is subject to avalanche risk um i debate that i think it's actually because they get more money out of storing coaches there so when people come up to resort in the summer on coach trips or transfers they put the big coaches there i'm not going to argue with that the business decision there is really quite obvious yeah. um and the cabbies, uh, the cab drivers, the lorry drivers all stay there because there are a few resources there. Like, you know, there's a toilet and things. Um, so you'll find a lot of places that you don't necessarily have access to hook up. So let's talk do. about that quickly. How do you find places that you know are going to be open in the winter? Because from our experience of touring, because we like going sort of October, November time and loads of campsites are shut. Mm -hmm. But I'm guessing like a lot of the airs are shut too because all the roads start to close when the mountains get yeah. shut. So how do you find places and know what they've got? So firstly, um, the easy thing to do is we, we actually have a site that we're populating and with the help of our um, Facebook group members actually, we're detailing a lot of that information. Like for example, yeah, you might be used to going to Les Alpes in the summer 
Um, if you go in the winter, this, you know, this is, these are things you need to watch out for. Um, we would use some of the online resources like Via Michelin to work out which mountain passes are closed. Okay. And the good news is that most passes that are closed are permanently closed in winter. Yeah. So you're not going to take any risks. There are places like the Simplon Pass, which close sporadically quite often when you're halfway up them. And, you know, and you have to do a plan B. Um, but you can plan around those things and there are lots of really good resources that will help you do that. Um, but it's the same with everything to do with winter motorhoming. You find LPG is harder to get. Uh, campsites are fewer. Uh, don't necessarily have the same services open that they do in the in the summer. Quite often airs are either restricted or closed or when they are there, they turn the water off, for example. And that's to obviously to stop freezing. Yeah. You know, and bless James, his first thing that he did, one of the first airs we arrived at was in Vosgeny, um, which is in the Grand Domain ski area, which is adjacent to uh, Alpe d'Huez. So one of the most popular tourist destinations for alpine skiing in, in the winter in France. And the tap was on permanently. And so James's instant like plumber instincts kicked in and he was like I must turn this tap off um, and we spoke to the people at the tourist office and they were like no 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 we leave it on so that it can keep running so it keeps running and our water is free <laughs> so yeah, but... um, you know so they're not concerned about it but um yeah so you might find a few things like waste is, is a little bit harder to find but in terms of finding spaces word of mouth mm -hmm. is is really important particularly when you're on the ground and if you're going somewhere or you've come somewhere sharing that information with people that you're on site with yeah. um with regards to campsites our biggest thing that um this season has been the closure of both airs and some campsites oh are they shutting are they so up to outdoors one of the best airs winter airs anywhere um has closed permanently which is a real shame because it had over 200 spots i think and it was in an amazing location really good mix skiing and uh, really accessible and the problem with that is the pressures the economic pressures um, have kicked in and you can get a lot more money out of selling that space to developers um, and in some cases lots of resorts are actually um, changing everything so that they're now uh, car free so they do need vast areas to park cars yeah. so that they can then park and ride um, people throughout the resort to ways when it's going to be harder to go like air skiing or are you just going to have to start booking into campsites? Both. Yeah. Yeah, so campsites are good. I think people are increasingly going to depend on campsites. Okay. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because that's contributing probably significantly more to the local economies, okay. um, especially in this time. And I, you know, I fully support that. We are big fans of airs. We like wild camping as well. There's going to be pressure on that. And there is pressure on that as much as there has been in Scotland because people don't always behave the way they should. It's just one of those things. So, yeah. So let's hope that actually more campsites are going to open up and see the economic value of opening over winter. And, you know, perhaps put on more frequent bus services. There are some campsites that have got it licked. And, you know, there are lots of really good campsites that other people can learn from that are a really good example of how you can really maximize your revenue in, in winter so we'd like to see more of that inevitably cool um while it comes to me what do you do with the dogs during winter they just stay in the van because i'm guessing it's the same like you have to leave the heating on all the time and things yeah lots of people who stay on campsites will um leave the heating on um, on very low um, because in some campsites in the winter you've got and, and I don't actually even know if this is true for the summer or whether anybody uses it but you've got a gas hookup so you can actually hook up to a mainline gas supply I've never heard of that okay yeah, yeah so you can you can get lots of gas um, supplies um, hooked up and that's in it's quite standard in lots of campsites in Austria okay of course you're going to pay for it and you're going to pay through the nose for it by the unit Okay, so if you could go to one place in the Alps, let's call it say the Alps, for somebody who wanted to start off skiing, snowboarding, but wanted to take their motor home for a week, where would you go? I get asked this question a lot, and every time I think I give a different answer. <laughs> um, so I'm going to base it on a few specifics. Um, I'm going to assume that people don't want to travel too far. 
yeah. um, from, let's say, Calais, um, that they don't want to necessarily negotiate any mountain roads that are difficult um, and that they want, let's assume that they would want the choice between a campsite or an air or they want to stay on a campsite but try a few days on an air just to see how they get on and how their, uh, their motorhome gets on. And probably for that, I'd say uh, Les Deux Alpes. Okay. Um, I mean, a campsite or Place because Les Deux Alpes is huge, isn't it? Yeah, um, Les Deux Alpes is actually, t it's two mountains. Basically, there's a, the good thing about uh, Les Deux Alpes is there is a really good air that's semi-service. So it does have electric, it does have a heated toilet, it does have waste disposal, and it does have fresh water. It's a short walk into town. It's got every service, but it's almost ski and ski out. Okay. Um, but then just at the other end of this, um, this resort, there is a campsite, but it's down the valley. And it is absolutely gorgeous. You get a telecabine up, um, but it gives you a real sense of being completely out of the way. Cool. What's the name of the campsite? Do you remember? I don't remember, but I'll um, yeah, in it and I'll, I'll send it to you. But it's um, it's really lovely. It's run by two people who are really, really enthusiastic uh, skiers, and it's not all singing or dancing. If somebody wanted an all singing or dancing campsite, Utopia campsites, which if you've travelled in Europe and you're used to using campsites, will know that's a big brand. There is one in a place called Borg Saint Maurice. Um, and that services uh, Les Arc and the Paradis ski area, so Le Plan. Um, and that's that's got a great bus. It's got everything. It's got heated lockers. It's got absolutely everything you want there. Can you really hear that? All I can hear is him. <laughs> yeah. Stop it. I'm not doing very well on this. Don't lick him. <laughs> We're not doing very well on this, are we, Fleurs? Are you two paying doing all right. We're doing all right. I, to be fair, I think you've answered most of my questions. Is there anything that I should have asked that I didn't know I had to ask? No, I think for us, it's about encouraging people to go motorhome skiing and not be frightened of it. Because I think a lot of people think that you need loads of gear, you need the right motorhome, you need to prepare, you need to book a campsite a year in advance. I mean, don't get me wrong, all of those things make life a lot easier, but this is supposed to be an adventure, and I think what we did felt like an adventure that we cannot repeat, because we now know too much. <laughs> and I know that sounds, that sounds silly, but had the resources that we now have with snowmad sites and winterized and um, if we'd had all that information, I don't think we would have learned as much <laughs> uh, and as fast. And yeah. we did everything the hard way. And I, I'm kind of pleased that we did. That doesn't mean I'd ever do it that way ever again. <laughs> um, we had a lot of. Anyone books. who's ever read your blog will know. <laughs> it's just a real adventure doing it. Uh, and, but. We really want to encourage people to try it, but do it responsibly and try and understand. We feel like we're responsible travellers before we started on this. So if you're completely new to motorhoming, you know, etiquette, the way you should behave, all of the things that you promote in terms of wild camping, in terms of doing the right thing, behaving in a, the right way. Um, a, an absolute thing that we hate more than anything, which I'm sure you do as well, is that there's a level of entitlement Mm. that people sometimes experience from um you know we have we're entitled to park where where we want we're entitled to do this we bring money to this area it's important our, our presence is important um is grossly overrated when it comes to skiing motome skiing um your it's a privilege to be able to take your motorhome into these resorts and it's super important to us that everybody adheres to you know some of the guidelines that we are trying to put together in a bit of a uh, a sort of manifesto of how we would like everybody in our community or everybody who's part of our community to behave um, and that means you know people think that having winter ties is about them it's not it's about other people it's about making sure that you're safe on the road and that you don't put anybody else at risk but it's also making sure that you don't cause traffic jams by getting stuck
and preventing other people from getting to their holidays and you know it's it's a big picture thing which i think a lot of people who get involved in traveling really embrace so yeah it's about getting out there and i really hope that you managed to get up there this year we we're not holding our breath for this year but we'll wait and see what happens it's not going to happen anymore i think but maybe january if we're lucky yeah, we'll keep, we'll keep you posted on which resorts are actually... Um... Yeah, well, France is still saying they're not going to lift a lot down until after Christmas at the moment. Yeah. So, there, I think a lot of uh, ski resorts are actually refunding their um, season passes. And I know that there are a lot of Austrian resorts that are really requesting from their local governments and local authorities that they don't have to open. Because they're symbiotic, you know, that the restaurants depend on the chalets, depend on the ski lifts, depend on all of this. But there are still opportunities to go to the mountains. That's one of the reasons why Motami is brilliant. So we've, we've got friends that run snowshoeing expeditions. And so even if the lifts aren't available and you're not a proficient skier, so you can't go off touring and things like that on, you know, your own mini expeditions. You can get anybody can put on a set of snowshoes and just you know disappear off with a guide it, you know you can have the most incredible experience. that obviously will only work once france stops the lockdown because at the moment you've got to register in a commune and you can't i would like we can't even go to the alps in france no and also once you're, those people who are in the mountains i know this was specific to last time whether it's the same this time is you cannot go 100 meters in altitude really so what they were trying to do is obviously prevent people from going out and getting that kind of experience by limiting the mm. distance that you, the, the vertical distance. Awesome. Which is crazy, so because surely if you're in the mountains, you should be able to ski, but we don't make the rules, so hey. Exactly. All right, well, thank you very much for sharing your knowledge. For everyone, I'm going to list all your websites and your Facebook group and stuff in the show notes below so people can find you and get more of your awesome knowledge. Um, and yeah, thank you to Arvind Fleur for being part of the experience. I could hear Mac outside. He was barking when Arvind was going at one point, but I didn't let him in. Well, I hope you found that as useful as I did. I've taken loads of notes. I hope that whenever we do get the green light to go off and can explore the mountains again, then we can put some of those tips to good use. So thank you very much, Hannah, for all of your help. I found it really useful. If you'd like to see more tips and tricks, then please do hit subscribe and the little bell to be notified. And I'll see you in the next video. Take care. Bye. Good.